what would happen if you go out and you fail? Like, what would prevent you from coming back to the same spot that you're at? Yeah. And um, that really helped a lot. And I actually, right when I read that, I put I emailed my two weeks notice in. <laughs> <laughs> hey, Islanders, and welcome to episode 141 of the Commando Voice. Today, I speak with the founder of Farm Fresh Northwest. Please welcome Mark Latham. Hi, I'm Brandon Erickson, and you're listening to the Camino Voice Podcast, where I interview local business owners, comedians, singers, and more. I dive into their backstory to find out how they got where they are, what are some of the tips for you to do the same, and find out where they are going. Tune in every week as I interview more of the people you see every day. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to another episode of the Camino Voice, where we release a new episode every Tuesday. How's your guys' week going? Um, I don't remember, I think it was two weeks ago now that I talked about putting myself into shock from a vacuum cleaner, uh, so that was fun. Um, over this past week, uh, one of our kids we had taken to the ER for rehydration uh, through IV, and the other one tried to knock out his front teeth by smashing them into the concrete. So this has been a fun few weeks for me, um, and so I hope your week is going better um, as I record this right now, the sun is trying to shine through, and so I am also hoping that winter is finally over and that we are starting to really turn that corner into summer. So um, with all that being said, um, here we go. Um, anyways, like I said, I hope your guys' week is going well. Um, so today I'm interviewing Mark Latham, who is the founder of Farm Fresh Northwest. And uh, if you haven't heard of them, uh, they are a meat delivery um, company. They deliver fresh ground, well, ground beef and steaks and all sorts of other meat options directly to your door. Um, and it's actually delivering meat that their family, not Mark's family, but his extended family, uh, produce um, from their own beef and um, other animals that they slaughter. Um, and it's just an extremely high quality, um, delicious meat that um, you can get delivered straight to your door. Um, so you don't have to worry about going to the grocery store for it. Uh, you don't have to think about it because I don't know about you, but for me, a lot of times I will um, end up going to the, you know, being like, oh, a steak sounds great or, you know, we want hamburgers tonight. But then you don't have the meat with you. So then you've got to go run to the store and, and hope that you get good quality and all that stuff. Um, they take care of all that for you because it delivers straight to your door. Um, and throughout this podcast, I was like, I'm getting hungry for a steak. <laughs> That's what I was thinking about. So, um, but, uh, he goes through, um, kind of what a lot of business owners go through. He, he talks about this whole evolution of, um, basically working in a day to day job and doing that. And then eventually coming to a point where he's like, I feel like I could do this on my own and do well. So why don't I do that? And finally kind of hitting that wall of being like, I'm just going to go out on my own. Um, and so, it, it, you know, I always find that fascinating, these people that have grown businesses from nothing uh, and turned them into a very successful business, uh, and especially when it comes to great products and good meat. Um, I love meat, so I'm always up for that. Um, so um, we get into all of that and more, a lot of the business lessons he had to learn along the way, uh, some of the personal growth he had to go through to become who he needed to be to be able to run a business like this. Uh, and, uh, yeah, and kind of where they're going from here. So we can do all of that and more, um, and <clears throat> stay tuned because at the end of the episode, I will have a promo code, um, that you guys, my listeners can use to get a, a discount <clears throat> on your first order. I think that's how it works. Um, and so be sure to look for that. Uh, it's also going to be in the show notes. So, um, be sure to look for that. Um, so anyways, without further ado, here's my conversation with Mark Latham. Hey, Islanders, and welcome to another episode of the Command of Voice. Today, I'm here with the founder of Farm Fresh Northwest. Welcome to the podcast, Mark Latham. Thanks for having me. Really yeah. appreciate it. So before we get started, tell us a little bit about Mark. Well, uh, I grew up eastern Washington, okay. um, about two miles from the Snake River. And uh, my family homesteaded there uh, 1900, so wow. we've been there a long time. <laughs> and uh, grew up there, didn't really know anything different. And, um, but it was nice. We were a long ways from town 
which is unique. Yeah. Um, about 25 minutes to where I went to like middle school and high school. Wow. 30 minutes to Tri Cities where like the grocery stores and stuff were. So uh, it was unique, and uh, but it was nice because you have space to roam and ride four wheelers and all that kind of thing. Yeah. So nice. Wouldn't change it for anything. Yeah. But you did feel, you know, you kind of feel isolated. <laughs> You're not running down to your friends or anything like Way that. Way out there. Did you did you have a lot of, uh, like, friends and stuff that were kind of in that area as well? Well, I mean, yeah, we had friends, but it was, like, five miles away would be, like, the closest <laughs> one. So we rode our bikes down there a couple times, but it was usually, like, having to coordinate to drive, you know, parents driving there or whatever. Yeah. Um, yeah, so definitely unique compared to what most people, you know, grew up with. But, yeah, my, my grandpa farmed wheat there and uh, it actually went into crp which is a preservation program crop reduction program back in the 80s when i was two so i didn't really get a um experience the entire you know harvest season and okay and all that but he still had cattle and and pigs all while i was growing up and yeah so we kind of got that side of the of farming yeah very cool. And you said, I think on your website it says uh, the farthest records you guys have is like 1904 that you guys homesteaded there. Yeah, I think. Uh, well, I'll have to check with my dad. I, <coughs> I think it. I think I put a 1904. I think it might have been 1900. I'm not 100 percent sure. Okay. But it's been. I was the sixth generation. Wow. There. Um, and so, uh, I think it was my grandma's um, grandparents and possibly their parents that came out originally. Um, that's crazy. Like, yeah. it's, it's, it's rare to find hundred year old homesteads in this area. Right. Yeah. Well, I mean, Washington was only, you know, 1889. So, um, wow. <laughs> yeah, there's just not that much history here compared to if you go back East. Yeah. Um, <laughs> wow. That's so cool. So, yeah, it's unique. So, awesome. Yeah. Do you guys have like family stories and stuff like that, that you have that's passed down from generations or. Yeah, there is a little bit. Um, I've kind of been more curious, you know, the last few years and asked my grandma questions before she gets, you know, too old to uh, recall everything. But, um, yeah, it's just a, you know, a lot of the things that they did. Oh, I, I asked her when they got air conditioning a couple months ago and, um, because the summers are so hot there, you yeah. know, you're getting over a hundred a couple weeks out of the year. And, uh, she said that they got it, uh, after she got married so it was like in the early 60s or late 50s. Okay. And so all growing up. Oh and I was word. like, what did you guys do <laughs> to get out of the heat? And so she said they would just like sleep under outside under the tree or go down into the basement. Oh. Um, but people were definitely much tougher yeah. <laughs> back then. I mean, it, I can't imagine living in 100 degree weather without any AC to re- go to. Yeah. And, and then they would ride down in the horses. Uh, they'd get water out of the river for their animals. Mm-hmm. Um, and so they would drive down there in the wagon and then they jump out in the river to okay. cool down. Um, wow. So stuff we take for granted, you know, yeah, is, um, yeah, it's been pretty amazing how resilient they were to yeah. just live in the desert and <laughs> put up with that. Yep. That's awesome. Um, and so you're, you've got like, you said your sixth generation of living there. So you planning on continuing that on long term eventually? Well, no. I mean, we we're over here. My wife's a West Sider, so I'm I'm a uh, you know we're at Stanwood out by Lake Goodwin. Um, my grandma just moved in to a nursing home. Okay. And so one of my uncles is still there, but nobody. We were the la- My parents were the last ones to kind of move off, besides my grandparents. Okay. Um, and so I don't know if there'll be another generation that goes back yeah but my my dad and um uncles and aunt are planning on keeping the land so okay that is uh that's a good thing nice so. very cool so um so uh growing up then what was it like for you growing up uh like quite a ways away from school but like do they do they still have buses out there or did you have to drive get driven in yeah so and through third grade, I went to a one-room schoolhouse that was only like three miles away. Okay. Um, and so that's the actual district that we were in. It's called Star District, Star School District. Um, they had their own buses. Okay. And so like they were all like the short buses. Uh, we would go to school, but they would also take us into um, middle school or high school 
and you could either go to Colotus, Connell, or down to Pasco. So you okay. had three choices because there was no middle school or okay. high school within the district. Yeah. Because it was like one room schoolhouse, <laughs> 12 kids or whatever, in K through six. So yeah. Um, yeah, first three years at the at Star, and then and then I went into Connell, which is a, you know, it's still a small town, but it's like three thousand people. And, okay. Um, yeah, so it was like you know twenty five thirty minute bus ride to school, and you know longer coming back because we took the other kids would go home first, but you get a lot of time to dream and uh, do your homework. Yeah, if you, if you didn't do it at home. Um, yeah, I, I didn't mind. We we were so used to driving everywhere. Yeah, you go to church on Sunday. It's twenty five minutes. Um, school, uh, anything in town, grocery store, um, twenty five or thirty minutes away. Okay. So it was just normal for me. Yep. But it is much different than what most people, yeah, you know, are used to. Yeah. Very cool. So. <clears throat> um, as you're growing up in kind of this environment, were you, what were you thinking as a kid? Were you just planning on continuing on like what your parents and grandparents had done? Or were you looking at other opportunities or different things? Other things, because uh, when you grow up, well, especially nowadays, like you don't see any future in farming or um, livestock in general. Because everything kind of sh- had shifted to like, factory or large farm. So even yeah. back home, like a lot of the smaller farmers, it's, you know, they sell off to the neighbor or the, some of them are like still own it and lease out their ground, but tractors got so expensive um, to operate a farm got so expensive. So everyone had to have more acreage, whether you're in the dry land or irrigated. And so if you wanted a farm, you had to have a lot of land. And um, I mean, farming's a weird thing because sometimes there's years where they don't make any money. Yeah. You know? <laughs> yeah. So it's a, it's like a, it's not a, like a desirable, um, <laughs> adventure to go on, you know? Right. Unless like you just love to do that kind of thing. So, yeah. Um, yeah. So yeah, there was no like thought of, it was always like, you know, it's great to grow up here. We showed pigs at the fair, had the livestock. Um, but it was never like, Oh, I want to, you know, expand this or grow this yeah. because it wasn't like an opportunity or you didn't see an opportunity for that. Um, and I think part of that's like growing up in the, you know, I was born in 86. So growing up in the nineties, early two thousands, everything really shifted strong towards um, the big supermarkets. You know, you go to one store, yeah. the super Walmarts and the super targets and all that go into one store to get everything. Yep. Um, and people weren't necessarily looking for stuff right from the farm. Yep. Until much later. Yeah. You started getting like it's 20, kind of circled back around a little yeah. bit. Yeah. So I think it was the timing of things of like at that time if I had seen somebody like selling their meat, you know, or doing or or even produce or whatever it is, um, kind of the model that we're doing now, it probably would have sparked something. But at, at that point, there was nothing really going yeah. on, and the and the demand. Yeah. Everyone was more about the convenience of having, they loved having everything in one store. Yeah. And we had yeah. shifted, our, our whole culture kind of shifted away from, you know, back in the 50s, 60s, yep. 70s, having multiple different stores that you would go to for different things. And um, yeah, so I've, I've thought about that, you know, over time. And it just, it was never a thought really that there was a future here. Yeah. It was more just like learning the lessons of farming and um, seeing something grow and, and harvest and that kind of thing. Yeah. Um, there's lessons there, but I always thought I would have to be taking those lessons and putting them towards yeah. some other type of business or, you know, work that I'm doing. So, yeah. yeah. Well, and, and, um, something that I've been learning about more recently is really that, uh, like if you're a really, really small farm, um, you can make a little bit of profit cause you kind of can run it and you can generate some, and you don't have like these massive expenses cause you're not, doing these massive things and you're selling your things at a little bit higher price because they're locally grown. Yep. And so you've got that ability, but then you can only get to this certain size. And then there's the mega farms, which are these massive farms that just have, you know, all of these people that come in and work and, you know, do that year in, year out. Um, But you kind of have to be in that. You have to already been born into that and like know that that's what you're doing. This medium range, maybe 
similar. <laughs> it's a, a a parallel path to like middle class right now. But like, right. Um, it's that thing of like, if you're in the middle there, like it's too expensive for you to actually make profit from. Cause yes, you have these years where you just make nothing and you actually go negative by a lot. Yep. Um, yep. Cause when things go wrong in a farming, it's not like, <laughs> you know, you're a couple hundred thousand or you're a couple thousand below the line. Like you're big chunks down. Right. Down. Right. Um, but what do you, I, I guess in that, because you've, you've seen that community and you've lived in that, do you see a, a, a path forward through for those people or is it just kind of like get out and, change it up or yeah that's kind of interesting i mean up until the last few years probably everything was um everything has shifted to like bigger and bigger like all the farmers over there are running um and and most of them are commercial you know row crops like most of the guys i grew up with and um, all the families around there and like equipment so expensive land has become so expensive even farm irrigation land um it's almost impossible to start yeah. uh, unless you have the land passed down to you that right. you can kind of make it. And even then, it's just, it's really expensive. So, uh, obviously, commodity prices are up a lot this year um, and probably will stay high for a while, which will give opportunity to, for people to make it. But, um, yeah, I don't know. I, I think it's just going to continue to go down that path of, larger and larger yeah. farms and most of the big farms are still run by families yeah i mean there's a few that are uh, you know like a regional or some of them are nationwide but yeah um and then they have farm managers but a lot of the big farms are still you know it's just like four brothers or yeah you know some cousins and whatnot it's yep. it's multiple people running it um yeah. but it's still a lot of their family that are that are doing the work and yeah and running things um yeah, that's a good question. I mean, it's hard to say, but I think it's going to go continue to be. It's going to be the bigger farmers, but at the same time, there's room for people to carve out niches yep. um, and go straight to consumer. If you know how to sell uh, and market, you can you can make it on a on a smaller scale. But the medium scale is probably the toughest thing to do because you're caught in that middle of yep. selling things wholesale, like the yep. big guys are. Um, and you got to produce a lot to be able to make it right in that in that world. So yeah. you could you could do a hybrid if you're if you're able to sell con- consumer, you can kind of live in both worlds, right? And have that consumer side still fund you, but um, or you can be smaller and do everything to consumer. And there's there's plenty of opportunity as more people are, are concerned with what they're putting in their body. Yeah. Um, yeah knowing where their meat meat or their food comes from yeah. in general. Yeah. So there, there's opportunity there. Very cool. So then um, coming to that realization then, um, as a as a kid then, what was it that, what did you end up going for in college then? Um, I didn't know what I wanted to do when I went to college, but I ended up doing business operations management. Okay. So it was like supply chain, logistics, production planning, which I my mind kind of works that way. So I was... Uh, I was happy that I ended up choosing that because even in college, like you don't really know. <laughs> yeah. yeah. Um, and after college, I worked for Bybee Foods, which is a lot like Twin City. They process uh, fresh vegetables, corn, peas, beans, and then sell them frozen. Um, so like what you see in Costco or different stores. And then I was there for, you know, I think eight months. And then I got on with Conagra Foods, Lamb Weston, which is the big... Um, French fry processing plant. Okay. And, uh, or plants. They, they are the number one producer in the world of French fries. Um, and that was a good experience. I, I enjoyed being around food. Like I'm a foodie. Yeah. And I was able to kind of use my degree a little bit. Yeah. Uh, Cause it was a lot of, it was production facility. So, um, but I always wanted to own my own business. Okay. And I, uh, you know, I had read a lot of Robert Kiyosaki Okay. Rich yeah. Dad Poor Dad. A lot of his series books and and uh, I forget which book it was, but he was like, in order to be successful in business, you have to know how to sell. Yeah. And I'm really introverted naturally, <laughs> and I did not. I had never thought of myself as going down that path of sales, yeah. and um, so I eventually put my two weeks notice in, and after about two years, and ended up going into sales. 
and uh, learned that for a few years before starting, figuring out what, we, what business I wanted to start. So, yeah. yeah. So what was that like for you? Um, because uh, I think that is a point that a lot of people um, struggle with. If you look at the finances of business or, or uh, jobs and things like that, um, the per like salespeople are almost always the top paid people in, in companies. Um, but I think a lot of people kind of fall into that category of like, well, I'm more of an introvert. So how do I get into sales? Um, what did you do to kind of help yourself get past all of that? Uh, one book I was reading, uh, it said, what would happen if you, if you tried, and it wasn't talking about necessarily sales, but like leaving your nine to five job more okay. like, what would happen if you go out and you fail? Like, what would prevent you from coming back to the same spot that you're at? Yeah. And um, that really helped a lot. And I actually, right when I read that, I put I emailed my two weeks notice in. <laughs> <laughs> um, but it does take, we're taught to do the safe thing, um, especially your parents' generation. You're taught in school, you're taught in college, get a good job, safe, secure, reliable income. Um put your money in your 401k or pension or whatever it is yep. and, and then retire. Yeah. And so we're taught to go down that path. Right. And so it's really hard to step away from that and outside of that. Yeah. Um, well, in that generation, that's what they did. Like you look at our generations, just a couple back, like that's what they did. They stayed at the same company for like 40 plus years Yep. would retire. And now they're living off that. Right. And it, and it worked at that time, especially cause there was pension, like every company had a pension. Yep. So it made sense to stay in one place. Um, and it doesn't now. Um, but yeah, it was, a lot of it is just, you got to take a risk and be willing to, willing to fail. And really the worst thing that can happen is you go bankrupt. And a lot of people are scared of that. I had a yeah. friend that had gone through that. Um, he started a business. One of the guys I actually went to learn sales from or sold, sold with. Um, and it's not the end of the world, you know? Yeah. So if you're not afraid to... Um, take some risk and be willing to worst case scenario and kind of run that through your head. Like I could go bankrupt um, if I'm not successful. And at the end of the day, it's not, it's not going to end your world to right. go bankrupt. You could just restart. It makes it a little bit harder, but um, I always felt like we're in America and we have the freedom to do what we um, what we want to do with our lives. And so I couldn't live with myself just going and working for somebody else for the rest of my life. Yeah. Um, when we have the opportunity to, yeah. to go build what we want to. Right. And so, um, I always kind of felt that inside. Like I, I gotta at least try, yeah. you know, and then if you don't, if you don't make it, you can always go back and, and, and go back to work, yep. make a living. But yeah. Um, and I think, I think yeah. what you're saying there is really important. I think a lot of people, um, that was something my dad would always tell me is like, well, what's the worst that can happen? Like, just get to that. And, and um, you know, and I've read it in more business books now. It's like a lot of them will actually tell you like, no, like not just say like, well, this is the worst that can happen, but like play it out. Like exactly. when you play it out, you remove a lot of the fear inside of it. And, yep. and then you're like, okay, so absolute worst case scenario is I go bankrupt and this is what happens. But then you also then get to put it on a scale of, what is the likeliness? Like, there's a chance I'll fail. Those, there's a huge chance I will fail because I'll fail in little things along the way. Right. But what is the chance that I will fail so badly that I will end up there? And you realize that's very, very far down the road. Yeah. Yep. Um, and even if you get to that point, you can recover. Yeah. So once you start to break down fears and it's not an unknown, yep. it makes it possible to actually push through that. It really is. And I mean, the fear of failure is the biggest hindrance for everybody. Um, and when I got into sales, you, you know, it's talked about a lot because you're, uh, <laughs> I, I was knocking doors selling home security okay. and, uh, you're facing failure every day, <laughs> <laughs> dozens of times. Yeah. So it's a mind game the entire time. Um, and, but it only takes one, you know, you make pretty good money even with just one sale in a day. So, um, yeah, it takes, it, it's a lot of mental strength and, and that, that was the most influential. It changed my life because it stretched me a lot. Just talking to people all day was exhausting. 
when you're introverted. <laughs> but I knew I needed to do it, and um, and what I learned from it, if you can sell door to door, you can you can you can really do anything. Yep. Um, you can sell anything. You can uh, do anything. You're treated you're treated terribly by a lot of people. Um, but it's good because it you know makes you tougher. Like yep. you can face anything. Um, and then and then you just learn to overcome objections, overcome fears and everything on a qu- on a quick scale and um and and then just you know that when you do have a success like you're meeting somebody for the first time ever you're a stranger on the door and then 45 minutes later they're signing a you know three-year contract or five-year contract or whatever yeah. and um you've built up a ton of relationship you know a lot of times people open up uh you know a lot about them they know a lot about you in a short amount of time and yeah. just be able to build a relationship or build um Camaraderie or uh, uh, report, build report in a quick amount of time yeah. is really a really valuable lesson that you can't just learn right. anywhere else. You know, yeah. it's so it's it's helped a lot. Uh, yeah, probably the most out of anything along the way. Yeah. So so after you were as you were selling these things and um, you got to that point where you felt like you had enough confidence and everything, what kind of drew you into the the direction to start Farm Fresh Northwest? So I always, uh, my sister married a farmer in Eastern Washington, back close to home, and um, they had an asparagus stand, and and they and they sold other things. Uh, ended up turning it into like a fall festival. But um, I always thought like, man, it's so nice that they have like a product like right from the farm to sell yeah. because it, like after you know it takes a lot to sell. I did home security and solar. It takes a lot to be, you know to give it to people. <laughs> to move forward with either of those things. Yeah. Um, like you're pulling teeth. And then, <laughs> and then they're like, you're at asparagus stand and people are just like driving up because they want, you know, asparagus right, that's picked like that day. Yeah. Um, or, or any products from the farm. And I was like, ah, it'd, it'd be so nice to have something like that, like that you produced or whatever um, that you could sell. And I it never even clicked that, um, you know, my grandpa's had beef for so many years. Yeah. And I never think about that as like a, a valuable item because it's just what we grew up with. We didn't know it was special. Um, yep. And, but then, um, so my wife, I think we were engaged at the time, and her parents uh, wanted to um, get a half of beef because they hadn't done it in a lot of years. And so they got it, and then, and then um, to them, the flavor was incredible, you know? Yeah. And I didn't know that it was like, you know, people in the city or, or uh, people that haven't had from the farm in a while um, yeah, <laughs> you forget like the, what the flavor difference is, right. and so that's kind of when I got clicking. And then a friend of mine had talked about his family kind of doing something similar to what we do. I think they were shipping, but not delivering. But um, that's kind of when all those three things kind of came together, and they're like, "Oh, we should. We do have something special. Uh, we should start a delivery, you know, to, to deliver it in small yeah. quantity." And there was a few. Um, a few people in California, we were in California selling solar at the time. Uh, there were some companies down there that were doing, or farms that were doing produce delivery, a lot yep. like Classic does here. Okay. Um, and they're like, oh, nobody's doing meat. You know, a lot, a lot of produce ones were popping up, full circle and all yep. these different ones. Um, nobody's doing meat straight to the door. And it's like, maybe there's a reason why nobody's <laughs> doing it. <laughs> like, we feel like it's a good idea. Everyone we talked to thought it was a great idea. Um, and so, yeah, we started probably about a year, year and a half, like ahead of time, like working our way to get back up here and, and get it going and figure out how to make it happen. And, um, yeah. Nice. That's kind of the journey. So what kind of, uh, <clears throat> so you guys started working on this idea that this could maybe work and stuff, um, but you said you were down in California. So then you had to like figure out, is it worth it to move all the way back up? Because I'm assuming you guys had your life built and kind of right, right, down. yeah. And it was it was like we got to save enough money to like have some capital to get going, and and uh, we wanted to get back up here. Um, and I knew I knew when I got into sales, it was only to learn sales to build a business. Yeah. Um, and I had been in it in about four years or three and a half years before we started, but um, yeah, our goal was to get back up to Washington because we're both from here, and and um be able to have grandparents around starting a family and those kind of things. Yeah. So that part wasn't hard. It was just more like, uh, having capital already, how quick can we grow it to be able to sustain ourselves? And, um, 
So I dr- we did a few things when we started. We drove Uber and Lyft, and I still sold some solar and okay and home security uh, to sustain ourselves until we could build up a big enough customer base to to live off of, basically. So. Okay. Nice. So then what was it like? Uh, I guess, um, how did that work when you approached your family about this? Um, yeah, they were all for it. I think, uh, I think a lot of people, well, every time I tell my grandpa, he, uh, like, oh, we have like 50 customers now or like a hundred and, and I, you know, update him and he just like couldn't believe it. <laughs> <laughs> so he kind of loved, he, he was the one in the family that was like more of the sales a salesperson at heart, um, even though he farmed, but he like, he sold, um, well with cattle and pigs, you're selling in general, but he had, a like a trailer dealership. So he would sell stock, oh, okay. tra- livestock trailers and yeah. horse trailers, that kind of thing. Um, so he was always kind of in that, in that realm. So I think it, he kind of lived through what we were doing. Um, yeah. So I think probably most of our family just doubted that it would work, you know? Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> um, but they were all, you know, they were supportive and my parents and, and in-laws are super, super supportive, um, through this whole time, um, loaned us, you know, small amounts of money at times to help us, you know, in different, different stages. So yeah. we couldn't do it without family, but, um, but yeah, I don't know how many of them actually believed that we would, <laughs> um, be around, you know, five and a half years later. <laughs> be successful with it but very cool um yeah i I just remember my grandpa every time i would update him on how many customers we had um he would just be shocked at like they want meat you know to their door like they can just go to the store i was like yeah but this is special yeah it's just um yeah just interesting to see that yeah Um, so then um once you guys got everybody on board and you decided to start start the business stuff, how did you guys start growing it then? Because you guys started zero, right? Yeah, started zero. So all I knew with sales was how to knock on doors, <laughs> yep. and so I just started with that because it was it was free. Yeah, it's just my time and gas to get to the neighborhood or whatever. Um, yeah, my wife grew up in Edmonds, so I, I think the very first neighborhood was just one of the uh, kind of where close to where she grew up in Edmonds, and then I picked up a freezer from a. Um, you know, off of Craigslist or whatever, uh, I think I got two freezers to start our business, like to yeah, store the meat inventory. Yep. And um, it was in a neighborhood in Bothell. And I was like, oh, this looks like a really good neighborhood. Like, he's like, as you, as you knock doors, like over years, you, you know, like just by the look of neighborhoods, yep. you know, is this, um, and uh, yeah, so just like looked like a good neighborhood, pretty dense where you can get to house to house pretty easily. So I started there, and that's really, like, I mean, even now, we still have a lot of customers in that very first neighborhood that I knocked. Um, so I just started there and just kind of expanded from there. And it worked really good for deliveries because all our customers were in, like, a two-mile radius. Yeah. <laughs> um, and so we just had one delivery day for, you know, for a <laughs> long time. And we, I actually sold uh, solar. Um, some of my friends started office in Rhode Island. And so I, w- I went back there for like a couple months to, you know, build up some more um, cash, you know, build a survive or whatever, yeah. live off of. And uh, my wife would fly back for a day, do the deliveries, and then fly back. I'd watch our little girl. I said, I'd take, out, I'd take a day off, and wow. she'd fly back, do the deliveries, and then come back the next day. Um, so we, like, kept our customer base going. It was, like, 30 or 40 customers at the time. Um. Yeah, so I think the first year and a half, I just knocked doors. Okay. And then we started, we decided to try some events, and we did the Puyallup Spring Fair. Yeah. Um, and because I was like, I would get like one or two people signed up a day yep. knocking. But yep. it's, so it's slow growth. Yeah. Um, and the wintertime's hard. It gets dark at 5 and 4.45. Yeah. Um, or if it's snowing or raining, it's just hard to be out for long. Um, or harder. Yeah, I think we signed up... 26 people or something that in those four days, okay. three or four days of the fair. And I was like, okay, it's, wow. it costs money. It costs <laughs> money to do it, but um, we can get a lot more people at one time. Yeah. And so then at that point we started doing a lot more festivals, taste of Edmonds, um, uh, different home shows. We did a lot of, a lot of, and then, and then started getting into farmer's markets as well. Um, 
and so that was really our growth all the way till 20, uh, 2020. Okay. And then events weren't. Yeah, yeah, events <laughs> you know, weren't going getting, on. Shut down. So. Yeah. So then, yeah. Uh, as you guys were slowly growing this through events and things like that, at, um, like it's one thing to have forty customers that you can all run through in a day or a couple of days, but like, what happened when you got to that breaking point? When yeah, too many? I mean, I was just like working all the time, so. <laughs> <laughs> um, yeah, I would put, I would put packages together. It, well, we had, we had our, all our deliveries on like the, the second week of the month. And then I think we added the first week of the month or third, one of those two. So during like those two weeks, my life was just like constantly. So I'd like, I'd go do deliveries. I would put pa- packages together, go do deliveries the next day. And then I come home and then from like six or seven until like one in the morning or two in the morning, I'd be putting packages together for the next day and then like just restart. So, um, and then we didn't have like, we have a really great system now for like inventory and orders and all that. But uh, we were like piecing it together and there wasn't much software available like in 2017, 2016. Yeah. So we would, you know, it would be like an Excel and then we would download it into a, this um, geo, I forget the name of it, but you could put it where it would plot um, like a route yep. or plot, at least plot it on the map. And then my wife was a UPS driver for a, years, a few years. She would like go through and try to make it, you know, most efficient route. And then we would have to go back and put the packages in that order. <laughs> it was, just, it took so much time compared <laughs> to what we're doing now. Um, yeah. A lot of, a lot of time, a lot of work, a lot of hours, yeah. But we eventually got a driver, um, and then so then I just could focus on putting the package together and responding to customers and that. And then 2020, it got pretty crazy. And, yeah, what uh, happened there? Pretty chaotic. Chaotic. Well, luckily in January, I'd hired um, a guy to help me do packages, put packages together. Um, so that was super helpful. But our last event was the Flower and Garden Show. Yep. In Seattle, and then they kind of shut things down after that. And so I, I wasn't quite ready, but I decided to turn on the Facebook advertising because uh, I was worried there was going to be a re- recession following really, like, really close. Like, let's gain customers now while we can. Yeah. Um, but things just took off like crazy <laughs> when, like, stay-at-home order hit. And um, some of the um, production plants got shut down in the Midwest, like, for b- beef and pork. Okay. Because of outbreaks. And uh, we, we basically gained too many customers at once. I mean, it, it got insane. Yeah. I had to shut off advertising and... And we played catch up for about four or five months <laughs> until our butcher could catch up. And, um, yeah, so that stretched us and, and figuring out that the systems we had in place were not sustainable to like scale at any yeah. level. <laughs> so um, Tobin started helping us out on, on the on the back end of um, making things more efficient and yeah. getting a system that can handle more customers. But uh, yeah, we—I mean, we made it. We made it happen. But yeah, it was uh, a little bit chaotic. <laughs> a little crazy there. Yeah. Nice. So then, as you were doing that, then and then you finally kind of optimized some of your system, working with Tobin and stuff on that. Yeah. Yeah. Um, September of 2020, I think we got the system put in, um, and uh, it saved us a lot of time, like putting packages together. It's it's an order already of, of the route, and so we didn't have to go back through and you know reorder the route after the route was set. So a lot of time saving. Um, we got a warehouse space January of um, 2021. Okay. We were out of our garage up until that point. Oh my word, that's crazy. So we had like 15 stand up freezers, like regular, <laughs> uh, in our garage, and then a small like eight by eight walk in right outside, and um, yeah, it was pretty packed. And not really set up like efficiently. So now, the warehouse space has has helped with that. Um, yeah, a lot of changes. Like from where we started, you think back or like look back, and it's yeah come a long ways. Yeah, it's kind of fun to see. Yeah, no, that's you know. awesome. And then, um, so um, as you were going through all of these different growing and growing pains and stuff of building this business, um, what are some of the biggest like learning moments that you had along the way? Well, that w- I mean, that uh, challenge in 2020 was was definitely one where it's like, okay, we we can't um, 
because up to that point, it was like, you know, you, you would just want to like, oh, if we could grow to this amount, like, it'd be great. But um, <laughs> you don't really know until you like get tested, like uh-huh. until you test your systems that you're doing. And like, yeah, okay, this is not scalable. Um, that was one. Another one, I think with any business is like cash flow and yeah. knowing, because the hard thing is like, well, starting out, we didn't, ha- we didn't have any data on like how often is a customer going to get an order? Yeah. We deliver monthly. But they can do it every other month, every three months, um, just one-time orders here and there. People move out of state. People, um, you know, decided it's not the right fit for them or whatever. And so, um, like, how much inventory do we need to have built? And yeah. animals, they, it'd be nice if they all got finished, you know, like, spread out throughout the year. Yep. But that's not how, how it works. <laughs> so, you know, you have more pigs more pigs being butchered a certain time of year, more cattle being butchered a certain time of year. And so you have to end up having inventory. Yeah. Um, you know, what are typically hand, those times so. of years that cattle and pigs are finished? Well, it, it really, it just depends on when your pigs are born. Like you, okay. you could technically spread it out, but then it, and then you don't really want to have, um, like right now we had pigs born, um, three litters born a month ago. And then one was a little bit late, and she, she was, or she had a litter uh, two days ago. But um, so now we're six months out from when those are going to be butchered. But they're going to be butchered all, yep. all you know about the same time. Okay. So, um, so you basically have that cluster of you know a couple months worth of inventory at once, or three or four months. Um, and then same with cattle. Like my my dad's um, cattle, they calve in mostly February, March, okay, and then a few come in April. So, uh, and they take, you know, 16 to 18 months to finish. Okay. And so they're all getting finished within like a four or five month time, time span. Okay. So early on, I knew we would have to have another farmer, uh, for beef. Um, just cause my grandpa didn't, he didn't have that many cows. Yeah. Um, and then just the tie, like you don't want, a beef can hold like two years in a freezer, just like if somebody buys a half, but. We try to, you know, have it where it's not storing for more than six months. Yep. But so our the other rancher that we use, um, he actually feeds for us, so we, we they all get fed the same way. Nice. Um, but he has calves that are born a uh, different time of year. Okay. So it balances out. Nice. He's got fall calves. So, um, and then you have that sixteen to eighteen month. You know, each a calf born in March or all your calves born in March, they're gonna finish. You know, over three months. Yeah. Time frame. So yeah. you have that natural, natural right. spread. Nice. Yeah. Very cool. Um, so now that you guys have kind of put some systems into place and things like that, um, how far out do you guys deliver? Uh, so we deliver from the border to Tumwater. Okay. And out in the Kitsap Peninsula. So pretty much the whole Puget Sound. Wow. Um, and we've had the, we've had that delivery radius for, for most of the time, probably the last four years or so. Okay. Um, and last year, I opened up shipping to the rest of Washington. Okay. And then we just opened up um, shipping to Oregon, Idaho, Montana, part of Montana, um, just because it's within two days, um, two day air, or two day ground. So uh, we just don't have that many. Most of our customers are close by, yeah, or you know, within our delivery area. So we're delivering, you know, ninety five percent of everything. We have like five, you know, five customers that we're shipping to. Okay. Um, but we wanted to open that up if there's people that, you know, find us online or referrals, um, that are in Oregon or Idaho, we wanted to have the ability to, to get it to them. Yeah. So that's great. So then, um, are you guys kind of hoping that eventually you start growing in that so that you really have a a big amount of shit? Yes. Well, our idea at the beginning was we named it Farm Fresh Northwest because I always, like at the beginning, I thought we could open up Portland market. We could open up. Uh, Boise. Yeah. And so that's why I named it Farm Fresh Northwest yeah. to begin with. And we haven't got to that point yet. But um, yeah, if we are able to grow enough in, in, you know, like one of those two areas, we could start doing our, like, our own deliveries down the road. Yeah. But uh, you, to have warehouse space and yep. that kind of thing, you have to have a, you know, a certain amount of customers to make it worth it versus yep. just shipping. Yeah. So. Um, yeah, I think down the road, especially with the growth in Boise, I think it would be a good market. 
And from like the farm back home, it's you know three and a half hours to Portland, four hours to here. Yeah, probably about four hours to Boise. So it's really all in that kind of same area. Yeah, it's about the same distance. You know, yeah. if you're as far as like local goes. Um, yeah. But but at the same time, like it is in Washington, people see that differently than like if you're someone in Oregon or a customer in Idaho. Like, oh, I got meat coming from Washington, even though it's the same distance. Yes. <laughs> yeah. As our customers in Seattle area. Yeah. Um, so yeah, it'll be see. It'll be interesting to see if we can add customers at the same rate in those places versus versus here in Washington. But yeah. Um, but yeah, that's kind of where we see it going. You know, down the road, expansion into the yeah. you know more markets. But cool. Yeah. So um, I'm curious. Uh, I feel like I, as I talk to different business owners, they all have different kind of methods of how they got to where they got to. Um, but something I'm curious about is, is from the beginning, did you have things, did you have like goals and things like that set to try and like this year I want to hit this or this or did things just kind of happen for you? Yeah, we had we had goals. I mean, we didn't reach them, but um, idea of kind of where we wanted to get to. And, and then it's kind of just been more, I'm not afraid to try like I've tried a lot of different marketing or advertising type of things yep. or ways to get customers so uh, like this last year we did radio which I never thought I would try but I wanted to just see like what it would, what it would well, do well and the price of radio yeah. has gone down right on a lot right. of them so so yeah, um, yeah there's just different and, and it's changing too the markets change um, and like with COVID all the events were canceled and so we had kind of gone down that path I wanted to get away from that because it takes up my time uh, to be there. You know, I, I was like every weekend you're away from your family. So um, Facebook was great in 2020, but then Facebook's not the same. Yeah. <laughs> <laughs> and, and when you were doing delivery service, uh, no matter what your product was, you were doing well. Yeah. You know, added a lot of customers in 2020. So we couldn't replicate that. Um, yeah. So I think, it, but I think the main thing of being, like a good business owner is not relying on one way or like being set on like, okay, this is how we're going to get customers and just yeah. do it forever. Yeah. Cause, uh, the world changes and the way people consume advertising or content or, um, consume products, whatever it all changes. So I think you just gotta be flexible yep. uh, through time. And then, but that also kind of makes it like, well, I can't like set, like we're going to gain this many customers this year. Right. It makes it a little bit harder to set, a specific goal when the world is changing, you know, kind of rapidly. But yeah. um, so with yeah. with events coming back this last this this year, there's been a lot more events that are kind of re doing their first real launch again. Are you guys looking at getting back into events again? Yeah, we're gonna do a few. Um, we continued with our farmers markets last year. We're doing that. We'll, we'll continue with farmers markets. Um, and then uh, Christmas bazaars have been really well for done really well for us. Um, I've kind of like looked at just the cost of different events yep. and the amount of customers we can get. So kind of narrowing it down to the most like cost effective events and, um, and a lot of them you have to sign up like six months in advance. Yes. And so yep. I was hesitant for a while to like make sure that people were actually going to come out <laughs> yep. to events before you spend that revenue. Yep. Um, and I let people like TJ and other, uh, I get, I get, uh, information from other business yeah. owners. Yeah on uh like how the events are yeah and I've, I've done that like once we started events i would ask people like what what other events are good yeah and it's so much easier to learn from other people yep. mistakes or or successes um than to spend money and and figure out like oh there's like nobody at this event or right. it's not the right type of um well, clientele so. And, and events are so weird because, like, I've, I've worked the San Juan Commando Fair. We used to do Frozen Explosion stands there. Yeah. And so it's so weird. Like, you're so dependent on weather, and it can't be too hot, and it can't be too cold. Yep. And, yep. like, just what else is going on in that area that weekend that, like, maybe has never happened, but then they're like, oh, we're going to start another event that right. is happening, like, in the next town over. And so, like, events are just such a wild card. Yeah, it is. It's really hit and miss, especially if it rains. Yeah, um, or like one summer we were like, up. "It's gonna be sunny. It's gonna be sunny," and then it was like a like ninety five degrees, and yep. like yep. no one was there because they were saying warnings on the right. the news like stay home and like no. <laughs> yeah, it is an interesting thing, and and um, 
and certain time of year, like in the wintertime, there's only like the indoor like home remodel shows and yep. home shows, which have been good for us, but they're also really expensive. Right. Um, so it's like, do you want to put that revenue out there and, um, and the time to be there? Yep. So it's kind of balanced that and, and, uh, and then just trying different things that are out there. Is there another way to gain customers at a more reasonable cost? Yeah. So I think that's always things you're going to yeah. constantly um, look at as a business owner. Yeah. It's always a challenge. Well, and with subscriptions, you've got attrition and you've got like, you've got to fight against attrition and then you've got to be growing at a certain yeah. rate and all that. Yeah. So, yeah. But we're in a good spot. I, I, I don't feel like as much urgency and stress because we have a good customer base built, a loyal customer base. And so we have an idea of like, how many deliveries we're going to have. Like I, over the next four months, I could probably tell you a range within like 10 or 20 deliveries of how many we're going to have. Yeah. Um, and so it's nice to know, like to have that kind of consistent baseline. Yeah. And then, um, and then obviously you want to keep, keep growing and, and expand business no matter what type of business you're in. But, um, there's not as much, um, not as much stress now as the first you know, yeah. three, four years. <laughs> <laughs> Very cool. <laughs> All right. Well, I like to end every podcast with some rapid fire questions. So the first one is what purchase of a hundred dollars or less have you enjoyed the most in the last three months? Um, I took, uh, we took our two oldest kids to PBR pro bull riding. Okay. Uh, it was in, um, Everett. Yeah. So just, I think last week. Nice. And, uh, Ticketmaster has some fees. So it was barely under that hundred dollar, hundred dollar <laughs> mark. Perfect. There you go. <laughs> it qualifies. All right. <laughs> uh, who's the most influential person outside of your family in your life? Um, I would say one of my high school football coaches, um, Clint Didier, he, he won a couple of Super Bowls and, um, a lot of the lessons that he taught us and kind of passed on to us. Like it's, it's stuff that stuck throughout my yeah. entire life that I use. And, um, I don't see him that often. I, his son's one of my best friends. So, uh, nice. I see him occasionally, but, but yeah, he was outside family. He's probably the most influential. Okay. Very cool. Um, okay. So complete this. This is a fill in the blank question. Okay. Um, I know this is weird, but I've always wanted to blank, uh, shoot a RPG. <laughs> okay. <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> I feel like you should be able to find somewhere over in Eastern Washington. Yeah. I probably, if I get my hands on one, I, get, I have space to shoot it, but, uh, <laughs> I don't know how legal that is. Yeah. All right. Um, who's an interesting or fascinating person in this community or, or just in general that I should interview yeah. next? I think you should interview Derek uh, Fekus. Okay. Very cool. Um, and then lastly, what piece of advice would you give your 20-year-old self? Mm -hmm. To get into sales uh, as soon as you can. <laughs> A lot sooner than I did. <laughs> How old were you when you started doing sales? Uh, I think it was 26. Okay. Yeah. Yeah. That's still pretty so, young. Yeah, yeah. I was just when in the office, there was a lot of guys that were, you know, 18 or 19 to start in college and they had such, you know, such a huge head start on, on, uh, that world. So, yeah. All right. And lastly, before we go, where can people find you on, on the socials, on websites, all that stuff? Yeah. So we're on uh, Facebook, Instagram, Twitter, uh, at farm fresh NW and okay. then online, um, all the ordering and everything can be done online, northwestfarmfresh.com. All righty. Yeah. Awesome. We'll have all those links in the show notes for sure. Perfect. All right. And thank you so much for joining me on the podcast today. Thanks for the time, Brandon. Appreciate all it. All right. All right. And Islanders, I will talk to you on the next one. Well, a big thank you to Mark Latham for joining me on the podcast today. And thank you for listening. And just like I promised at the beginning of this episode, uh, I have a promo code for you guys. The promo code is Kameno. Just Kameno spelled out C-A-M as in Mary, A-N as in Nancy, O. And if you put that in at checkout, uh, you will get $15 off your first order with them. Um, so, again, that's Kameno at checkout. Uh, and, um, yeah, so I'm super excited. This is the first time I've ever done, a, like, a, in any sort of advertising promotion through the podcast. So it's very exciting. Um, anyways, be sure to use it so that we can uh, keep the show going and get, uh, 
you know, maybe more sponsors in the future. So anyways, um, thank you again for Mark for joining me on the podcast. Um, and if you want to find out more about this episode, uh, anything that we talked about, uh, or find more episodes, you can go to tomatocommons.com slash podcast. That's tomatocommons.com slash podcast. Thanks for listening and see you next time.